Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Mike Whitmer. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items I'd like to review with you. Uh, first of all, today's webinar is pre-recorded to accommodate schedules during this busy time of year. That means you won't have the opportunity to ask any questions live, but if you do have questions, you can go to the contact us uh, section on ncmic.com, pose a question there, or feel free to give us a call. Our phone number is up on the screen. We'd be happy to point you in the right direction for resources to help. I did also want to tell you about our next webinar scheduled for January 18th at 2 p.m. Central Time. I hope that you'll be able to join us for that. Remember that the webinar will be recorded and posted on our resources page on ncmic.com if you can't join us on the 18th. So let's go ahead and get into uh, the, today's program. Uh, our guest today frequent guest on our webinar, Dr. Evan Gwilliam. Dr. Gwilliam is a frequent sp speaker on all issues, billing and coding, and it helps keep a lot of doctors out of trouble there. So we're very happy to have him here. Dr. Gwilliam is clinical director for PayDC Chiropractic Software. He's a graduate of Palmer College and is a certified professional coding and ICD-10 instructor, Medicare compliance specialist, and certified professional medical auditor. Dr. Gwilliam provides expert witness testimony medical record audits, and online courses for healthcare providers. Dr. Gwilliam, I'm really excited to have you here because you always give us such great information. And I'm looking forward to see what and hear what 2024 has in store for us. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You can go ahead and put your slides up and take it away. Terrific. Thank you very much, Mike. Let me get my screen up there for everyone. I am... As always, I'm excited to be here and share with you what matters. This presentation sort of has two elements to it, uh, one of which is what's changed, what's new, what's been added, but more of what I'm going to talk to you about are what are the obstacles and challenges we're still facing. They're not new. They've been around for years, but they're still problems that we're dealing with. I met just earlier this morning with one of my billing friends, and she kind of reminded me and let me know, hey, these are the things that I'm seeing on billing. We're getting denials for this. Doctors are messing up this and that. I want to share with you most common ones so that we can eliminate them and help you kind of just glide right through and get paid for the work you do. So um, as, as Mike uh, implied, I have a bunch of certifications. I want you to know that I've done my homework here, and I hope that uh, what I share with you is useful and relevant. So um, without further ado, here we go. The things I'm sharing with you are accurate as best I can at this time. Things change all the time. In fact, that's part of why we're doing this presentation, because some things have changed in this past year and are going to affect what you do next year. So I'm going to do my best to keep it accurate um, and uh, updated. However, uh, it might all be wrong, maybe. So if it's all wrong, that's OK. Just reach out to us and we'll find the, the right stuff for you. Um, what I will plan to cover with you today in the time we have together is what's new with ICD-10 for 2024. ICD-10 changes actually took effect October 1st of 2023, and that's their, their year. But you know, if you haven't heard yet, I'll give you the changes that you need to be aware of for most of the next year. Um, I'm going to hit on one element that I hit on last year when we did this presentation because it's still a problem. It's the excludes one and what that means. And I will explain that to you so you know how to not make that mistake. We talk about CPT codes and what has changed there. And I'm only aware of one change that affects chiropractors, and that is with e &M codes. There's been a slight change there that I will explain to you in a few minutes. Um, and then we're going to spend some time on some other current coding issues and common errors, which is going to include the use of 97014 versus G0283, code for ESTEM. We're going to talk about doctors doing routine re-exams and E&M bundling and some issues we're facing there. And I'll give you some solutions on how to fix that. Um, the 5.9 modifier, been around for a long time. We use it a lot, but it can be overused. I want to warn you of what you need to do there and when it's appropriate and when it's not. And then I want to finish up with the concept of diagnosis pointing which is actually something I think will help you a lot um, to save you a lot of headache. If you learn how to do this properly, if you're not already, it can save you a lot of trouble and help you communicate effectively with third parties. All right, so that's what I have in store for you. Without further ado, again, let's get right into ICD-10. And some of what I want to share with you is some things that um, I just bring up every year, just some background to help you understand how ICD-10 works. So. ICD actually stands for International Classification of Diseases. 
It originated as international classification of death, and it was a way for keeping track of death certificates for the World Health Organization and, and how people died around the world and all this data and statistics. Um, but we began using it for clinical stuff way back in the 70s. It was the ninth revision by then, and the U.S. added their own twist to it. It's called ICD-9-CM. CM is the U.S. version of these this data set that had these ways to codify diseases. And that's in the 70s. They updated them in the 90s for a 10th revision called ICD-10. And we thought we'd be using them shortly thereafter, but it took a while. We worked on them. The U.S. got their version done in 1994, or at least uh, started, I should say. And we finally implemented ICD-10 in 2015. Now, the code set is updated every year in October. And it was updated in October of 2023. And they changed it. The codes became official that I'm about to show you in October 2023. But we'll call them 2024 changes because that's most of the, the year 2024. But just understand that October 1st, there may be other changes that go into effect on October 1st. So be aware that those don't happen on January 1st, but October. But um, I'll show you what those changes are that will be in place for most of 2024. Just so you're aware, um, ICD-11, the 11th revision of ICD codes was released in 2022 uh, for the World Health Organization and other international groups. Uh, the clinical modification that will be used in US has not been done yet, but probably will happen in the next five to 10 years. So stay tuned, we'll have a whole new code set. And there are some pretty dramatic changes in ICD-11 that we've already been able to look at, but uh, we'll do a webinar when the time comes. So don't worry about that just yet. Every year we get these changes. Here's just a quick summary of the last few years so you can see the trends. Um, from 2020, there were almost 500 changes. There was a big jump in 2022, some stuff around um, COVID and things. 2023, we don't see a ton of changes. There's 395 new codes. There are 22 revisions and 25 deleted for, for that happened at the end of 2023 and will be in effect for all of 2024. 123 of these changes of the 395 for this year are for external cause codes that affect accidents and injuries. And chiropractors don't use those a ton, perhaps for some personal injury cases, but they're optional. Those codes aren't required. And so a lot of doctors don't use external cause codes. There are also 36 new codes for osteoporosis that talk about pathological fractures in the pelvis. So those are interesting, but probably not that relevant to chiropractors. Okay. These updates also include a bunch of new headers and revisions. There's about 130 of those. So again, most of these changes are not that significant. If you really want to get to the bottom of it, though, this is the source. Just go to your Google and type in CMS uh, ICD-10, and you'll be brought to this page. This is where we can find the official updates. This is where I got the information I'm about to share with you. It's from here. And if you go to the bottom of this page, there's several downloads. The one I use is, is the addendum. The addendum is a, is a concise summary of all the revisions. They also say, here's the current file of all the codes. Um, but this is what I'm what I'm pulling for you is from the addendum, which says, here's the changes summarized in one document. And I think there was 80 or 90 pages in this document. And I'm going to share with you three of them, three pages that I think have stuff in it that might apply to chiropractors. OK, so I'm about to show you changes to ICD-10 codes that occurred on October 1st, 2023, are in effect until October 1st of 2024. Um, and you should be aware of these, these few changes. One was changes to some of the migraine codes. If you look here, you see that the category for migraine codes is G43. Some of you may be um, developing a migraine right now as a result of this presentation. I apologize for that, but that's one of the side effects of listening to me talk about codes. G43.1 was there before. It was migraine with aura. But what they added was chronic migraine with aura, which is G43.E, which is interesting. They used a letter here, and they can do that, letters or numbers. And so they added G43.E, which is chronic migraines with aura. Before the changes, there was just codes for migraine with aura. They didn't specify if it was chronic or not. And so if you go down through that, there are six, well, four more finalized codes that talk about the specifics of different types of chronic migraines with aura and whether or not they're intractable or have status migranosis, which is beyond the scope of what I want to talk to you about today. Just understand that if you do use migraine diagnosis codes, there were essentially four complete codes added to the code set that you need to be aware of. And they include explaining that these migraines are chronic. Side note, the definition of a chronic headache is more than two weeks of the month for more than three months, depending on who you ask. That's from the, I forget the name of the group, but it's like the official headache society of the world. And I would hate to be part of that society, but they're the ones who define headaches and stuff. And they said, chronic is more than half the month, three months in a row. So there's new codes for chronic migraines. 
Here's another change that occurred that's going to be in place for 2024. It's scoliosis. Um, they revised a description for adolescent scoliosis to include adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. That's what they changed. And they changed a few guidelines to point to that code. Um, so instead of just saying the code is M4 1.12 is adolescent scoliosis, they added adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, meaning we don't know the cause. So that's a slight change. And maybe some of you deal with scoliosis and you need to know about this. Most chiropractors in my experience, and when I, I do code reviews and audits, I don't see scoliosis used routinely by chiropractors. I think you need some special training for that. So this may or may not affect you. Um, another change that occurred, this is the last one I wanna show you. Uh, actually, I have two more. Uh, this is another change that occurred for 2024. And these are real changes. Um, external cause codes are codes that explain how an injury occurred or where the patient was. And they all start with the letters X, uh, W, X, Y. Um, those are the, the uh, V, W, X, and Y. Sorry, they all start with those four letters. Here's some new W codes that went into effect that talk about objects or organic material entering into an orifice through the body. I don't know that chiropractors are going to use these, but I think they're fascinating. And you want to see that those who are overseeing the code set, they're focused on things like this. We have codes for bazaars entering through an orifice, rubber bands entering into an orifice of your body, food, insects. So I find that all fascinating. I don't know that chiropractors are treating patients for insects that have entered into orifices through their body, but I think it's fascinating. There are codes that address these very critical issues for healthcare in the United States. Um, okay, so there's there's things entering into parts of the body. Let me give you one more group of changes. Um, this is a proposed change, and I don't know if it's going to take effect, but I want to share it with you. If you recall last year, if those of you who attended this presentation last year, I showed you some code changes, and we talked about some proposed codes for zombification and zombie-related codes. They did not go into effect. They were fascinating codes. There's a whole list of them. I've got some new ones to show you here, though. Um, let me see if I can find them. I'm going to pull these up for you. Oops, where are my codes? Mm -mm. Just a moment here. Where is it? I apologize. I had it pulled up and I lost it. Oh, here they are. Okay. So um, I pulled this up off the website. These are some proposed changes. This is a new chapter of codes, uh, a, new, a new block of codes in the chapter for X codes. These are exposure to supernatural forces. And so um, these are things like, um, you know, superheroes causing injuries. So we have, they have a statement here that says, uh, these codes are reviewed by certain groups, the Avengers, the Jedi Order, the Justice League, X-Men. So those are the ones who have the authority to change these codes. And you can see that a lot of these codes deal with um, like certain types of injuries, like how many buildings were you thrown through? You know, was it three buildings, four buildings when you were thrown by a superhero? Um, were you, was a truck dropped on you, a subway train? Um, there's all kinds of options here for these codes to describe different ways patients could get injured. Um, you know, a rooftop antenna billboards being thrown at you by a superhero. Um, then this section is about injury due to photonic or light wave based energy, such as um, eye beams, finger beams coming from the mouth. So if, you know, freezing, uh, you know, like um, different superheroes have different powers. And so we need to address all those options here. Uh, let me just share with you one more before we move on. If we go to the last page, there's some good stuff here about where was it? Uh, different devices causing injury. We've got Acme rockets, the Death Star, uh, Destructo Beam, the Kregel. If those of you remember the Lego movie, the Kregel is something that could injure, cause problems, fear gas, and so on. So being hit by the invisible jet, uh, Calvin and Hobbes fans might recognize the transmogrifier. So this is a proposed group of new codes. Until they become in effect, don't worry about it, but I want you to be aware that that's a possibility, even though it's part of an April Fool's joke and it's whatever. Uh, last year, I showed you the zombie codes. If you need access to more codes, I have a whole chapter on aliens, um, one about political uh, ideologies and how those can injure you. So feel free to reach out, and I'm happy to share with you links so you can access more of these um, fun codes that we may or may not be actually using. We're not going to use them. They're not, they're not real. Um, now, let me talk to you about some other issues. I talked about this last year. I'm going to talk about it every year because doctors are seeing denials on this, and they still don't quite know what to do with it. Here's the problem. There are certain codes that can't be used together in, in ICD-10. There are codes that are considered redundant or bundled into each other. And so, for example, you can't say the patient has um, a strain of the low back and also say they have low back pain because low back pain is part of a strain of the low back. And so that's an example of an excludes one. 
Um, when you look up a code in ICD-10, there are guidelines and it says excludes one and it lists some codes. It says excludes two and it lists some codes. I'm not gonna talk about excludes two right now because those don't affect payment. The problem we're running into with coding is doctors using codes that should not be used together because there's an excludes one. Excludes one means the codes are mutually exclusive. They cannot be coded together. Let me give you another example. You can't say the patient has an acquired condition and the congenital version of that condition. Either they were born with it or they got it later. And so those codes are excludes one. They're mutually exclusive. Either you were born with it or it came later. It's congenital or acquired. And there's no, you can't have both at the same time of the same, for the same problem. So when we see a code that says, here's the code and there's an excludes one, it means you should not use those codes together. The problem is that sometimes doctors don't understand that and they just want to throw out all the codes that look like they might fit and they didn't bother looking at the guidelines. And so you code things that are mutually exclusive. When you see excludes one, when you look up a code in a code book, or if you um, look it up online, it'll list the code with excludes one. You can only use one. You can't use the ones under the list and the one on top. You have to use the one on top or something from the list. They're mutually exclusive. Okay, excludes two is different. With excludes two, you can use those other codes. They're just, um, they're just not included in each other. And it does not really affect payment. Um, but the problem is doctors using codes that have excludes one incorrectly and they get a denial. And they say, we looked at your claim form and it has codes that don't belong to you. An example is M5450, which was a new code a couple of years ago. Um, that's low back pain unspecified. And the excludes one there includes strain, um, lumbago due to a disc, lumbago with sciatica. So what they're saying is if you code for say, lumbago with sciatica, you cannot also code for low back pain. We know your patient has low back pain. In fact, we already know because you, it was included in the code that you already used. So there's no need to code in addition the low back pain when it's already part of this code. When someone has a strain, you don't code low back pain because a strain includes low back pain. And that's what these are trying to say. Um, so you need to be aware of this. A lot of doctors, this is the most common one I see where doctors have this listed in their codes and they say, I'm getting denial, how come? And I simply look and find that they're also using another code that it's included in. Um, if you look down here, I've got another example at the bottom of your screen for M546, which is pain in the thoracic spine. You can't do this one along with any of the disc codes from M51, and there's a whole bunch of them. The irony is M546 is for the thoracic spine, M51 includes codes for the lumbar spine, and you think you should be able to report pain in the lump, thoracic and the lumbar disc codes, but you can't because of this rule, and the rule's kind of weird, and I think it's a little messed up, but I'm letting you know that if you're seeing denials and they say that your diagnosis codes are not compatible or they're wrong or they can't process them, it's be, probably because there's an excludes one, okay? And you can look it up online, find the code, and underneath it'll say excludes one. And if you're using your code and one of the excludes one, that means you're doing it wrong and you need to only use one or the other, okay? And that's what you need to know. If you really need help with this, you can always uh, contact me and I can look them up for you, but it's really not that hard to find. Okay, so those are the ICD-10 changes I want you to be aware of for 2024. Uh, and this excludes one issue that is causing denials and lack of payment. Those are the couple things I want to talk to you about with ICD-10. Now I want to talk about CPT codes, specifically just the E&M codes, actually, because there were changes, and the, and the AMA is the one who owns the CPT codes, and they changed them, and their, their changes go into effect on January 1st. Um, and so these are the codes that we have for E&M services, and you'll notice there's 10 of them. There's there's, uh, these are office codes. So there's separate E&M codes for things like hospital or nursing home or emergency room or preventive medicine or telemedicine. Those are all different codes. These are just the codes for an office visit for an E&M service or evaluation and management. And these are the codes for a regular office visit that's just to checking out the patient, figuring out what to do next. Okay, there used to be 10 of them actually. A couple of years ago, they got rid of the first code there, 99201, so that's gone. There's only nine codes now. Um, and that was some changes that happened for in 2021. When it comes to these codes, when we look at the guidelines, we are told that you can code two ways. You can pick the code two ways. And the two ways are either medical decision-making or time. And I'm not gonna talk to you about medical decision-making today. We don't have time. That's just, that hasn't changed. This is just, that's just the way it works. And that's the way it's worked for several years now. Um, when it comes to e &M codes, there are three elements. There's history, exam, and the third one is going to be either medical decision making or time. And I want to talk to you about time because they changed it a little bit. Um, what they did was they changed it to say that the time must be met or exceeded. So let me just explain this better. Uh, if you look at this table on the left, we see what it said before for 2023. It said the 99202 has to be 15 to 29 minutes. If you're using time instead of medical decision making to pick your code, 
then you use this range. But now they change the rule to say it has to be 15 minutes, must be met or exceeded. And if you hit 30 minutes and you meet or exceed that, then you can go to 99203. And they used to say 45 to 59, but now they say you have to hit 45 and you have to meet or exceed 45 minutes. At the end of the day, this doesn't mean anything in terms of what you do. It's the same, it has the same meaning. It's just a little more simplified and it's more consistent with the wording they've used for other codes. And so, again, they used to give us a range. Now they just say you have to meet or exceed. And um, that's really all there is to know. If you do a re-exam on a patient and you spend at least 10 minutes doing it, you can build a 99212 based on time. Or you can look at the requirements for medical decision making and use that to justify your 99212. Some doctors swear by using time as an easier way. Um, others say that medical decision making makes more sense for most chiropractors. I say it depends. Um, you know, if I were to do a re-exam on a patient and it took nine minutes, technically I couldn't bill any codes because you have to meet or exceed 10 minutes. And so that kind of stinks, but I could bill a 99212 if I didn't spend 10 minutes and I did it based on medical decision-making and I understood the rules there. So again, medical decision-making has a whole different kind of framework and you need to understand how it works and you look at what it's required for 99212, but you could bill for a code that took less than 10 minutes if you follow those medical decision-making guidelines properly. And that would be true for any of these codes. So I want you to understand there is some value and, and there may be a good reason to use MDM instead of time. Um, if you've been told that time is the easiest way, because Maybe you spend 30 minutes with your patient um, and you can get to a level four, but maybe you get to a level four without spending 30 minutes using medical decision making instead. And there's good reasons to, to do that. Get paid properly for what you do and so on. Uh, I wanna talk some more about um, e &M, but let me give you a quick review of what counts for time. If you wanna bill your e &M code based on time, these are the nine elements that are in the official guidelines that say count for time. And what's interesting about time is it isn't just face-to-face -face time with the patient, it's face-to-face -face time or time spent on that patient's encounter after the patient leaves or before they arrive. And that was something that changed back in 2021. That hasn't changed for this year. That's been around for a while. But these are the nine things you could count for, um, for time. You know, an example might be the doctor spends time after patient hours. The patient's gone, but they're looking over the patient's films. They're calculating their outcome assessment scores and, and, and putting those into the record. That time counts towards the total time that you can count for your EM code. Maybe um, there's a doctor who's an associate working with a lead doctor and they schedule a meeting for 10 minutes to go over a case and there's 10 minutes spent discussing the case between the two doctors. That can count towards the time. Uh, maybe the doctor spends all kinds of time taking the history because the new patient is 300 years old and his wife is there and he forgets everything and she keeps interrupting and saying, no, 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 you didn't fall on Thursday, you fell on Wednesday and the moon was full and you, you were out in the garden. And so there's this couple arguing about the history and it takes forever to get the information you need for the record. That time counts. You can count your time spent on that. Um, and those are all outlined in these nine boxes, okay? Now, the guidelines tell us there are certain things you cannot count for time. Uh, one is travel time to and from the patient's location. Another is teaching. That's kind of general, not specific to that patient. Like if you're just teaching about the spine and how it works and muscle fibers and stuff. Um, also, you don't get to count time that's spent on other services that are separately reportable. So if I sit and review x-rays, I don't get to count that time towards my EM code. I count that towards my x-ray code, right? You don't get to count time supervising ancillary staff um, or the ancillary staff's time. If your staff is the one doing the history, you don't get to count their time. It's the doctor's time that counts, okay? So those are all straight from the guidelines. I just put them in pretty boxes to help you understand. Um, if you were to document and use time to justify your EM codes, this is not new either, but here are some suggestions. The minimum requirement for the way that the guidelines read is you should say, I spent total time was 24 minutes, okay? And I think the note should say, exam time 24 minutes at a minimum, and then you can pick the code based on 24 minutes. Um, if you wanna be a little more thorough, you could put in start and stop time, which I think is better. I think it makes it more accurate and it's, it's easier to defend if someone challenges you on what you spent your time doing. I like start and stop time, that's better, but not required, okay? And you could also do non-continuous. If you wanna record start and stop time for when you're with the patient and then they leave and you spend another few minutes reviewing the records, writing up a care plan, that, that's another way that's very thorough but not specifically required. You could just say total time, 24 minutes and be good. But I would encourage you to consider being more thorough and putting in the start and stop times, okay? So here's an example of what it might look like in a note. Um, I just made up an example here. I picked three things from the nine boxes that we had that we could say what, what the time was. And I said, physician spent 24 minutes of total time, not including, not including separately built procedures like x-rays and stuff, performing three things, the exam, 
uh, educating the patient and documenting the information in the record. That's what I spent my 24 minutes doing. I documented it. I didn't have to do this. You're not required to list these things in your record. But if you do, it's better. It's more defensible. And um, it's it's hard for someone to dispute that your EM code was um, upcoded. Okay. <clears throat> so if you want to document something lazy, like we spent, you know, 10 to 20 minutes doing an exam, the coder is obligated to pick the lowest number that you stated. So do not do a range, do the actual time. If you do a range, it may hurt you. And, and it's inaccurate. You don't spend 10 to 20 minutes examining a patient. You spend a specific amount of time, take the extra effort it takes to specify what that time is so that your records are defensible. Okay. I want to talk about one other CPT code. We talked about EM codes. That one change was how they described the time element. But again, it's not that big a deal. Just keep doing what you're doing. I hope those other tips I just gave you are going to help you do that more accurately. Another issue that's very, very common and still very much a problem right now is e-STEM coding. The official CPT code for electric STEM unattended is 97014. And that is the code that is the official code in the code set. It can be used for most payers. However, some years ago, Medicare looked at that and said, I don't like the wording on that code. We're going to make our own. So they made up their own code. It's G0283. It's more or less the same thing, but they clarified it to say it's not for wound care and it's got a therapy plan in place. They, they wanted this clarification. So they said, if you're going to bill e through Medicare, we need to see this code. If you use the other code, we don't recognize it. We don't allow it. The patient can't be charged. It's just thrown out. So for Medicare, you got to use a G0283. This is not new. This slide I'm sharing with you right now is not something that's new. It's not a change. This has been around for a long, long time, but doctors still mess it up and get denied and don't get paid. And it's costing you, you know, it's costing you money. So here's what I want you to know. If it's Medicare or United Healthcare or UMR, they want G0283 instead of 97014. This is one of the few instances where codes are totally interchangeable and you can use one or the other, but certain payers have specific requirements. And United Healthcare often says, oh, we'll do whatever Medicare says. So United Healthcare, including UMR, wants G0283 when you bill for each stem, and Medicare wants G0283 if you're billing it through them to get a denial for a secondary, perhaps. And 97014 is still the appropriate code for almost all other payers. There may be other ones, pocket payers here or there, that little ones that say, well, by the way, we want G0283, but for the most part, 97014 for everybody except for Medicare and United Healthcare, and G0283 for them. All right. So that's just a coding issue that is very common and doctors are getting denials and have to resubmit claims and it costs you money. So don't make that mistake. Now, I want to talk about modifiers for a moment because we're still having issues with modifier problems too. These are not new rules. Again, I want to clarify, I'm not sharing new rules with you. I'm sharing with you a common error that's costing doctors money lately. Um, it's the bundling of E&M codes. So think of it this way. Think about sitting down to have some pie on Christmas, okay? Or Thanksgiving, whatever, a holiday where you like to have pie. Um, maybe just like pie, forget the holiday. You want some pie, you can buy a pie, it's 10 bucks, okay, for a pie. But you say, I don't want a pecan pie that's 10 bucks and a whole apple pie that's 10 bucks. I wanna save some money. I want 10 bucks for one pie that's split down the middle. It's a half and half pie and it's still only 10 bucks, but it's got two different flavors in it. Chiropractic manipulative treatment and e &M codes are considered part of the same pie. And if you want to have both, you get 10 bucks because they are two flavors in one. And that's just how the definition works. If, however, you want to get paid for two pies instead of one pie with two flavors, you want 10 and 10 instead of one $10 pie with two flavors, you gotta add the two five modifier. It's sort of like this, right? We got our, our one pie that's split down the middle. Instead, we got two pies. We wanna get paid for two pies, okay? <clears throat> if you look in the official guidelines, we are told that you can get paid for both services separately if with the 2.5 modifier, as long as that e &M service is significant and separately identifiable. And underline the keywords here. Um, I wanna emphasize again, these are not new rules. This has always been in the place, but I wanna give you these tips so that you can reduce errors, okay? If you have an e &M that's significant and it's beyond the usual pre-service and post-service work that's tied with an adjustment, because when you do an adjustment, you do an evaluation, but we wanna, we wanna get paid for a separate evaluation that's beyond just that. The 2.5 modifier tells them, yep, two separate pies, two pies, 10 bucks each, want to get paid for each, okay? They do tell us also that if you don't bill a CMT that day, you don't need the 2.5 modifier. The 2.5 is just there to show that when you have a CMT, an adjustment, and an EM, they're, they're separate. So if you only did an exam that day, then there's no modifier necessary. I believe that there are certain situations where you might be able to argue that they the EM service was significant and separately identifiable. 
Um, maybe a periodic reevaluation, but I tell you what, a lot of payers are just not paying for these anymore. You might believe it's the standard of care for you to do an evaluation every six to 12 visits, or we used to think 30 days. And I would like to argue that you should get paid for that. However, a lot of payers are now just saying, nope, that kind of reval is not reimbursable. And if you really want to do it, you may be allowed to charge the patient for that extra exam, or you just don't do an extra exam at that interval because they don't pay. However, if you look at evidence-based guidelines, they do say that that's still the standard is to do an exam every six to 12 visits that's above and beyond and really is significant and separately identifiable and helps you figure out what to do next. Other good circumstances for the 2-5 modifier for a separate e &M is a brand new condition or an exacerbation or a new injury or a return after a lapse in care or perhaps a discharge. Um, <clears throat> regardless, I would suggest you document this. Someone in your records say, today did a significant and separately identifiable e &M service prior to or after the CMT service. Um, or even go so far as to say, I did, I did the exam, it stopped, and then I started the CMT. Like put that right in the record to show that they're significant, separate. Don't just put everything in there and try to say, well, some of this is an exam and some of this is, is CMT. Try to consider separating them out completely. And if you can document that as separately as possible, then um, you're much more likely to get paid for that separate e &M service if they do a, a, a chart review. There's one Blue Cross Blue Shield carrier that says you can get paid for a re-exam only at the initial eval and when there's significant change. So if you do a re-eval that's routine and there's no significant change, they're not going to pay you for it. You need to understand that re-exams are not an automatic reset that supports medical necessity. There has to be some indication that it was warranted, like a lapse in care or significant changes in their condition. Um, maybe you update box 14 on the claim form, which is the date of onset, like a brand new condition is starting again or, or something. Um, maybe you have new diagnosis codes or new procedures. That would, might justify the exam. Um, but don't just change diagnosis codes for the sake of trying to get paid. Change it only if it's true for the patient and it's accurate and describes what's going on. There are a lot of denials coming from Aetna and Blue Cross Blue Shield right now um, because the codes aren't being used properly. They're billing them out all the time, hoping that they'll get paid extra for that extra service. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there is this database, and this is not new either. Um, it's called the NCCI edits and it's, it's created by Medicare and it's national correct coding initiative. And they say, here's a code and here's all the other codes that are included in this one. So you, when you build this one, you don't get to build these other ones cause they're all included. And I've highlighted here in yellow, you can see that if I build 989.1 on the left, there are three codes that are relevant to chiropractors that are considered part of an adjustment. They're bundled in and you can't get paid separately for them unless you do something special. So think of it like this. This is, is that same pie we're talking about. It's our chiropractic manipulative treatment pie but it's got four flavors now. Chiropractic manipulation includes 9712, 124, and 140, which are a bunch of other services. And if you just do them, you're not gonna get paid for them. They think you're doing one pie with four flavors and you're not doing four separate pies. Now, if you do wanna get paid for separate pies here, four different separate pies instead of one pie with four flavors, um, then you need to add a modifier. So according to the Medicare, which is the authoritative source here, the NCCI didn't say, that these three other codes need the 5-9 modifier if you're gonna get paid separately for it if you're doing an adjustment that day and billing for a CMT. And it's it's neuromuscular reeducation, massage, and manual therapy. Now, only the manual therapy has a special rule that says it has to be a separate body region. There's no rule like that for massage or neuromuscular reeducation. So if you're trying to get paid for those, you don't have to document a separate body region, but for 97140 manual therapy, you do. And so how do we do that? Well. And by the way, I put the reference here. If you're getting in trouble for this and you're saying, I'm doing it in a different body region, I'm documenting it separately, and they're still denying it, then you can reference the CPT assistant March 2006. It's a newsletter from the AMA that explains this rule. Okay. Also note that if you're doing some other code and you want to put a 5.9 on it, don't. There are not other codes that need the 5.9. Um, my, my billing friend was telling me that that's one of the issues that she's running into is doctors are just throwing the 5.9 on everything because they think it makes you get paid. The 5.9 isn't necessary for anything else. It's only necessary for codes that are bundled together. And the only ones that are bundled together are these three into the CMT, the only ones that are relevant to Kairos. So let's let's do a little deeper dive into 9 sub 140. And again, this is not new stuff I'm sharing with you right now. This is just a big deal. It's a problem. And doctors are still making this mistake. So I want to make sure you understand. 9 sub 140 is manual therapy techniques. And it's bundled into chiropractic manipulation, but it could be payable if you do it in a separate body region. The way that you indicate that on the claim form is with the 5-9 modifier or one of the X modifiers, usually the XS, which stands for separate structure. The, the, the thing is this, providers for years have started overusing 5-9. And so 
somebody told him, if you put the five nine on there, you get paid. And that is not what the five nine means. The five nine means the thing I'm doing is totally separate. It's a whole other pie, not just another flavor within the pie. And since it was overused several years ago, they came out with X modifiers to be more clear. And some payers will allow you to use these X modifiers. For this code, the XS is particularly appropriate because it's more specific. It says separate structure, and that's great. Um, the problem is, well, and so the, one of the keys here is diagnosis pointing. This is kind of the last topic I want to talk to you about in, in this presentation today is how to do diagnosis pointing. Um, this is a snippet from some, my software, and you can see the code I've circled here is 97140. I've done it in addition to an adjustment. I put the 59 modifier in there, okay, which is me saying it's totally separate. It's a distinct procedure, and I want to get paid for this one in addition to the adjustment. It's not part of the adjustment. It's something separate. And the way that I'm proving that is I go over here to the right, and I have my list of diagnoses. And so I've got a separate diagnosis. This one here, M7541, is for the shoulder. And these ones up here are for the spine. And so I'm saying this procedure or treatment is for the spine. And this one has a 5.9 because it was not on the spine. It was part of, it was for the shoulder. And I could have done the XS modifier as well. Some payers don't like the X modifiers. I think all of them still are okay with the 5.9, but I think that some may push and say, no more 5.9. We don't like it as much. We like the X. So just be aware of that possibility. Um, my point is this, use your diagnosis pointers. This is, this is a, an important takeaway for you from this presentation. And it's not something new. It's just something that is a common issue that providers can, can get up front and reduce denials and reduce coding issues and errors by simply selecting the right diagnosis for each procedure. It's not okay to just have every diagnosis point to every procedure. If I did 9943, which is extra spinal manipulation, and it pointed to a diagnosis that was a cervical spine, that wouldn't make any sense. And if I was a payer, I wouldn't pay because you don't pay for extra spinal manipulation to the spine. It doesn't make any sense. And this same thing with this code. Um, I'm not going to pay if you have the same diagnoses for both the adjustment and the 97140. So don't do it. What you find is there are denials and it says something like incidental to primary procedure. If it has the same diagnosis code, they're calling it incidental to the primary procedure and bundling it together because they're saying it's for the same diagnosis. But if you're treating a different diagnosis, then you're better able to justify it as a separate and distinct procedure that's distinctly payable. Okay. So in other words, use your claim form to communicate. Don't, don't over look the value of the claim form, which can tell a story without them having to read your records. Okay, here's an example. I've got this blue arrow pointing to various things. Um, this box here is the diagnosis codes. And in this example I have here, um, <clears throat> you know, I have three different diagnosis codes. If you go down here, you have three different procedures and they don't all point to the same diagnoses. This, this particular procedure points to one diagnosis and these other ones point to other diagnoses. And so that is what you need to be doing on your claims to tell the story and explain how the procedures each have their own purpose. Okay, another, this blue arrow up here on the left is also very important. And I wanna mention this last point. Um, this is the date of onset. This is where you can explain when this problem began and when you began treatment for this episode of care. Now for Medicare, it's the date of the first visit that they came in for, for help. It's not when the problem began, it's the first encounter where they came into your office. But for all other payers and for all other healthcare specialties, um, this box right here is the date of onset when the problem began. So when they got hit by a, a, a bus, you know, when they fell down the cliff, whatever. Um, and you can put that date in there. If you've been treating the patient for many months and that problem resolved and they come in and say, doc, um, you know, I just fell down my stairs. I would change that date and put in the date they fell down the stairs. That indicates it's a new episode of care. And it will help show that you're not just providing prolonged care with no end. Um, so change the date when they have a new onset and it's a new episode. You've ended the old episode. Don't be afraid to get in there and, and update that. If that date hasn't changed for 15 years and you've been seeing the patient forever, it looks like you're a lousy doctor and you're not able to resolve anything even after 15 years of treatment when certain problems usually resolve within four to eight weeks, you know? So don't forget to do, use the claim form to your advantage. Use the diagnosis pointers and use the date of onset to indicate information that you don't want to have to send in records for. Because when you have to send in records, it takes your time and money and that is no fun. Which is no fun. So those are all the issues I wanted to share with you today regarding issues that I would want to be aware of for the year 2024. We talked about a few new ICD-10 codes, some migraines and that one scoliosis code. And then we talked about those orifice codes and the uh, supernatural forces codes. Then we talked about excludes one and how you should be aware of that and make sure you're not using codes that aren't compatible and shouldn't go together. 
And then we discussed the brief e &M code change, which is how they describe the time instead of a range. They say you have to meet or exceed a certain time. And then I got into some current coding issues. We have um, the proper code for eSTEM, G0283 is for Medicare and United Healthcare and maybe some others. Um, we talked about doing routine re-exams and how they're just not paying for that much anymore and how they try to bundle the ENM codes in and how you can combat that by documenting very clearly and using billing it in circumstances where you know it's totally distinct and separate. We talked about the overuse of the 5.9 modifier, making sure you're very, very clear that whatever you're doing is totally separate from the adjustment if you want to show the 5.9 is, is separate. And then we looked at diagnosis pointing at the claim form a little bit and talked about how you can use that to get things done right and, and reduce errors later on by getting up front and doing it the way you can with what you've been given. Okay. So that is everything I've got for you today, Mike. I hope that's helpful. All too. right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. All that talk of pie. I'm kind of hungry now, I'm afraid. Me too. I'll meet you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Gwilliam, for being here, as always. Uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, to our listeners, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar was pre-recorded, so you don't have the opportunity to ask questions live. However, if you do have any questions, please get in touch with us either, either through NCMIC ncmic.com, the uh, contact us section, or uh, you can give us a call into our client service center. We'd be happy to point you in the direction of more resources. Uh, before I go, I would like to remind you of our resources section on ncmic.com. This webinar will be posted there as soon as it's uh, uh, available. Uh, we're continually adding to our content with information to help you navigate daily practice and deal with the challenges that you face. Uh, we have information out there on a wide variety of topics uh, that doctors face in daily practice, so please do check that out. You can also keep up to date on new resources from NCMIC by following us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And uh, one last reminder, our next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, January 18th at 2 p.m. Central Time. I hope that you'll be able to join us. Until then, thank you for listening. Dr. William, thank you for being here. Happy holidays to everyone and talk soon.